Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we join again today in study, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may more completely see the symbols and the words that he has presented for our admonition at this time. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to join together today. We thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We ask, Father, as we open your word, that your spirit may guide us and that your angels may attend us. Help us so that we may more come to experience that which we need at this time that will strengthen us in order for us to give a message to this world. I thank you for each one that is here. Help us now that we may look upon these examples and may come to understand both the symbolism and the reality that is before us. Direct us now so that we may draw closer to you. For this we ask, for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we look to complete this portion of Numbers 24, we have this admonition, nevertheless, the Kenite shall be wasted until Asher shall carry thee away captive. So the Kenites were going to go into captivity with the Assyrians because the Assyrians were going to take them away from the area that they had been inhabiting. As we also finish this portion, we find now that Balaam has taken up another parable another prophecy and when he and he took up his parable and said alas who shall live when god doeth this in numbers 24 24 a numerical doubling we are introduced and the ships shall come from the coast of chittim and shall afflict asher and shall afflict Eber, and he also shall perish forever. In the spelling that is before us of Chittim, this could be said as being the first mention of Chittim. However, as we as we would look at this. In Genesis 10.4, we find the genealogy. And the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. Now, if I understand it correctly, the Hebrew would pronounce this as Kitty. Would that be correct? Well, yeah. So if you look at just the thing, it'll say kitty, but this is plural. Okay. Right. So, and it refers to pretty much, I think it's Cyprus, but, um, uh, but yeah, it's just in the context here. I'm, I'm looking here at Daniel right now. So let me go back to numbers. Yeah, because this this portion of Daniel by the uh, by the translators was kind of interesting because it ties this right in with what we have addressed in the past out of Daniel eleven. 
That's just when you see kitim, it'll be plural, right? So the im at the end is just their the Hebrew plural. So okay. kitty is the the root if it's in the singular. But okay. I don't know if you see it in the singular anywhere. It's it's only in two verses in the Bible. Really, kitim? No, kitty. Ten Genesis ten four and First Chronicles one seven. Okay, well, the rest of these all would have it as kittim. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, just that spelling you're saying. Yeah, the, the spelling is just a, a different way of trying because it's ch, right? It's not a k sound. Okay, it's uh because it's a kaf, uh, uh, a kof, um, it's a kaf cough with a dot in it so it gives it that uh. yeah it's it's not it's not not as much as the ch in in bach but but it's similar so it's just not you could you could pronounce it as k or the uh. so okay. yeah it's just not uh it's it's not the cough or the cough i can't even remember which one is. it's not the one that's usually pronounced k but they have they basically have three different k sounds in hebrew okay <laughs> so here we are with the translators applying daniel 11:30 for the chips of kittim shall come against him therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant so shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. At the beginning of things with the children of Israel, we have Kittim. Excuse me. And at the end, mm -hmm. again, we have Kittim. So, symbolically what are we seeing here okay so in daniel 11 verse 30 the way we understand this is um that this is talking about rome and what's going to happen to rome is this what it's talking about here right um at the time appointed, he shall return, come towards the south. He shall not be as the former, as at the latter. For the ships of Kittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. So the he that is grieved is who? I was, I was thinking king in the north. Okay. Um, So this is going to be dealing with Rome, and let me see here. I have a paraphrase of it, so I'm just going to find this. Here it is. Okay, so when we get to verse 30, the way that you would paraphrase praise it uh, for the ships of Kittim, the way that we've understand understood this is the Germanic tribal invasions shall come against him pagan Rome therefore he paganism and papism shall be grieved in return and have indignation against the holy covenant paganism and papalism try to destroy Christianity so shall he do he shall even return make a final attempt to survive and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Paganism enters Christianity, papacy corrupts and persecutes Christianity. That's the way that it's sort of understood um, in that uh, historic application. That's one way it's understood. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, do you have any thoughts on this?
Yeah, so I think we applied it to uh, the vandals, to Genseric. Okay, to Genseric. Specifically, rather. Rather yes. than the Germanic tribal invasion, I think he's specifically the... to the vandals. Yes, because I think it's, is it Revelation? Yeah. Chapter 8. It deals with the, that sort of specific uh, trumpet. Yeah, and it's the Vandals who come by 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 sea. Is that the idea? Yes. Because 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 Kittim is reference to Cyprus, but but it it's sort of the ships of Kittim. Yes, but they is, is a symbol. Yeah. No, no. Well, the actual the they moved. They sort of. They were in Cyprus, and then these are like the Phoenician type traders. So they were in Cyprus, and then they went to Asia area, and then they set up base in Carthage. Okay. So it was the same sort of. Uh, they originated from uh, Cyprus. Yeah. So with Carthage, which is the, of course on the 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 coast of North Africa, but this is that period of time. So, so they just call them the ships of Kittim as a symbol, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so just clarifying those points. So here, so when it talks about ships shall come from the coast of Kittim and afflict Asher, Asher, of course, is Assyria. Right. So, so there is this then historic. So when you look in the book of Daniel, it's actually referencing this in Numbers 24, 24. But now Asher is, is symbolizing the papacy and, and Rome. So pagan and papal Rome. So would we then say that Eber is symbolizing the Protestants? Um, well, I don't know. Um, well, I don't know. Eber, I'm not sure about. Do we have any other references for Eber to know what Eber might, might symbolize? I mean, it's, it's where, um, see here um, judges he was the spouse of jail or yael <laughs> i think Rand has something to say Rand, did you have something to say uh no i just use a different kind of mute oh yeah okay. yeah there's different uh ebers um but this one would be referring to the Ebers that existed before. Uh, so unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were, were children born. They have a patriarchs. But as, as you're pointing out, there are several different Ebers because you have Eber through Shem, mm -hmm. and then you have Eber again through Arphaxad. Yeah. And then you have Eber through Salah. Yeah. I mean, the word means the region beyond. Right. So it would just be being used in that sense of it, the meaning of the word itself. So, yeah, so if we go back to, okay, so we got these Kenites, and have we really resolved how we are looking at this prophecy? Because, I mean, these four parables in the last oracle how would we understand these? How are we trying to make application of them?
So it, it's talking about the coming of Christ, the first one. Right. Correct. Okay. And then, um, and then you're going to have. Uh, so, so that's going to be fourteen, and then, and then in verse twenty, he took up this parable against Amalek first of the nations, but his latter end shall perish forever. So could we take these as progressing from the time of Christ to our time? I think that'd be one way of looking at it. Okay. So, I mean, okay, here's Amalek. Yeah. Amalek as a symbol will be an interesting definition amalek as a reference is the nation that first warred against the children of israel right now amalek as a symbol would be one representing those that first warred against the modern children of israel yeah because it progresses here from amalek um who's going to be punished correct and the kenites right we're going to try to hide in the nest in a rock and they're going to be carried away captive by the assyrians right by asher and then um, then the ships of Kittim shall come against the Assyrians and afflict also Eber. So that, that's the progression. And if this, is, if this is referencing then from the time of Christ up to the second coming, how would we then make these applications of Amalek, the Kenites, um, and... Uh, Asher, who, you know, who, do, who are these representing? And why would we have the ships of Kittim coming against Asher? So, <clears throat> would we make this application just after the time of Christ or after 1844? Well, I would put this okay so so i'm looking at the time of christ because we have this star that comes out of jacob so i'm just looking at its its basic application so it's basic application this i mean we know that it refers to christ this star that comes out of jacob and if if this is the case it would represent the the periods that we have um either just up to the time of the Millerites, so like four generations, parallel somewhat to um, uh, the first four churches, or the, you know, even how we deal with uh, uh, the seals or or the trumpets, you know, those types of things, where we're, we're having this period of time. Um, so I just don't know. I just don't know how to apply it. I, I don't have the key to sort of unlock this. I mean, could Amalek represent pagan Rome? Would the Canaanites represent, um, so, or some aspect or some history of Rome? What else were the Kenites known for? Um, well, they were smiths, but um, <laughs> so as smiths, they would be ones that would be able to make swords. Would that be a fair application? 
Yeah, well, we dealt with it in Judges chapter four. Now we have Eber there as well, so that's um, another Eber, anyway. Uh, Heber, the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, of the father-in-law of Moses, right? So we had studied all of that um, in in the story of Sisera, right? So, you know, so in order to make this application, I mean, we can make an application to our time, but we first want to look at the original application of these four parables. Um, so the issue with the Kenites, um, what what was what was that we learned about the Kenites? Well, where Heber was concerned, or Eber, yeah, it's, since it's the same Hebrew he, root, he, yeah, it's the same word. Yeah, they had separated themselves from the other Midianites. Mm, and they all, and yeah, okay, so they had separated themselves and they were connecting themselves to the Israelites. Correct. So they came away from the from the Midianites, and that's going to be very important when we get into the next chapter. Mm -hmm. So, the, the separation of Eber, or Heber, yeah. is something that we're going to have to apply in looking at both the original story in its context and being able to look at the symbolic representation for what we're dealing with. Uh, to answer the question from the chat, I don't know. I mean, my understanding is that Hebrews or Hibaru was one from across the river. Yeah, yeah, it means on the other side of the river. So there's a, a relationship to the name, at least, as far as its meaning. Um, in that this is the, because Eber means, you know, basically far away. Like, uh, what, was, what was it we said about Eber? Um, Uh, well, it actually means comrade, but uh, just hang on. Yeah, so the region beyond. Right, so that's the idea. Um, so something beyond the river, on the other side of the river, that would be, and they are spelt differently, but they mean the same thing. But it's also interesting in this, in this one verse mm -hmm. <clears throat> that here come the ships from the coast of Kittim, and those ships shall afflict Asher, and shall afflict Eber, and he also shall perish forever. Now, is this he also giving reference to Eber or to the ships of Kittim? Um, well, I think it would refer to Asher. Which is the third, the third possibility, yes. Yeah. Because this is the end of Assyria. Which is, of course, a symbol of Babylon. Right. And we've applied in the past that the ships of Kittim 
are representative of the economic power, isn't it? Yeah, well, we definitely apply it later on in Daniel. Yeah. So this is going to be um, events at the end of the world is the way that I would prefer to look at this. Um, in even even if you make the original application, this is from the time of Christ up to the second coming, because he shall also, also perish forever. So this is going to, these symbols that are here in Balaam's, what they call Balaam's final oracle, these last four parables, I think there's ideas here that are picked up later in Daniel and the other prophets. Um, I, it's with different, different symbols, but they're, they're still parallel symbols. Right. I mean, there's so much of this. I mean, when when we're looking at at this, especially dealing with Kittim, we see this being picked up in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, but also in Ezekiel. Yeah, we also have, you know, the the translators put uh, Matthew twenty four fifteen when it came to this verse, in re, in re, reference to he shall afflict Eber, when therefore ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. So they're taking Eber here to represent the Jews. Okay because of how they understand that verse. So they would even be applying this, from what I can see, they would have to be applying this to uh, all to the time of Christ. If, you know, if, if that's how they're going to take a parallel to this verse. But they're looking at this as all one final oracle dealing with what's going to happen with the destruction of Jerusalem, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. <clears throat> so if this is dealing with the final destruction of Jerusalem, for our time, would that mean the destruction of the structure of the corporate church? Um, well, we're going to afflict Eber. So to me, the destruction is this is a prophecy against Asher, uh, Numbers 24, 24. Not really a prophecy against Eber. Okay. But ships of Kitten, to me, this, this would have to be some kind of judgment against Asher. And the question is, what is Asher representing here? Um, you know, are we dealing with something that happens before or after the close of probation? Is Asher representing the papacy? Because it's back. I would think that the logic is there that Asher is representing the papacy. So then who is it? Who are the ships that shall come from the coast of Kittim? Is this similar to um, the what happens in Revelation uh, chapter? Let me see here. Which chapter is it? I always forget. Um, chapter 16, when it talks about, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, that, that section there. The drying up of the river Euphrates we take as um, the support 
being withdrawn from the papacy uh, during the time of the plagues. And that leads to the threefold union in the sense of uh, the death decree that's going to, to result. So is this about the fall of Babylon, right? And you're going to have 16, 17, and 18, um, all sort of dealing with that history in a sort of repetitive way. So you finally have the fall of Babylon, and that would be the fall of Assyria or Asher. Is that making sense? It's got a couple of good points. And then, I've, I've never looked at it that way before. Yeah. So in this then, when he fell afflict Eber, uh, that would be the persecution that happens to God's true people in that period of time. And the ships of Kittim then, this must refer to some power that's going to come against the papacy. Because, you know, the papacy is going to, I mean, it's, it's not going to be in harmony. These three different powers, they're only in harmony for a short time. We know they, they come together at the Sunday law. But then you have the plagues fall, but then they have to unite again in this death decree. Do we make a an application similar to the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet with these three powers? Well, maybe. Um, maybe these are referring to the to the different powers that that exist. So, because we're going to have Asher, so that's going to be the papacy, but Asher is going to carry a group away captive, the Kenite, right? Correct. But Asher itself is going to be destroyed. And so the question is, who is the Kenite? Is that the United States? Um, strong is thy dwelling place, thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Would that refer to the United States? That could be an interesting application. I don't, I, Again, I've not considered it in that manner before. Okay. And then you have Amalek. So what would Amalek refer to? Is this, is this the world, the globalists? Because they're the first of the nations. That's where's the first of the nations referred to? Well, there again, if we go back to that verse, And when he looked upon Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations that warred against Israel. Yeah. Now that's the alternate reading. Yeah. Instead of saying that Amalek was the first of the nations and leaving it off, they were the first of the nations that warred against Israel. Right. But, but his, go ahead. But, but that's something they've added. It's not there in the Hebrew at all. So it's not in the Hebrew at all. No, nothing in the Hebrew. Yeah, that's something they've added. So where would they have come up with that in 1769 or well, in 1611? They're, they're just they're just adding that as that's what they think it means. So they put that there. But there's nothing in the Hebrew that says anything like that. Okay. So is there reference? to Exodus 17, 8, incorrect. Um, yeah, see, if I'm going to look at the first of the nations, I'm going to think of the Tower of Babel. All right. But that takes us right back then to Babylon, 
right? Right. But it's but this is Babylon. The Tower of Babel is the globalists, right? We use it as a symbol for the UN. I mean, the UN uses it as a symbol for themselves. Um, right. So that's that's the globalism. Genesis eleven one. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. But. Okay, and when, when we're looking at the word that they, they're using that translates the first of the nations. Yeah. Hebrew 1471, goyim. So. Yeah, the goyim, that's, that's nations, that refers to the Gentiles. In the sense of massing, a foreign nation, hence a Gentile, also figuratively a troop of animals or a flight of locusts. Mm -hmm. So you would want to put Amalek as dealing with Islam. Well, I'm no, I'm not trying to put it there. I'm asking questions. Okay, is it? Well, I mean, that's always true of the word goyim, that it can refer to a flight of locusts, because it has to do with the gathering of things, right? A massing of things, and that's the way they think of. The nations as these masses that come in so they use it for for a flight of locusts as well right and and here of course it's in the plural not just goy it's goyin the nations and um and the word uh rashit that's uh same first word as the bible bereshit in the beginning so it means the beginning of time so the beginning of nations Amalek was the beginning of nations. And so that makes me think of um, Babylon, right? Because that is the beginning of nations. And, and we would go to, um, now, of course, there's a connection here because when you go to um, Genesis 10, uh, talking about these descendants of Ham, right? Cush, Mitzrayim, which is Egypt, uh, Put, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush. Um, and one is that Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. And out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, the city of Rehoboth and Tela. And there was, we had a dispute about this, um, what this means, uh, who Asher is, and, and why, how, what its connected connection to Babylon is. But we're going to have um, Asher mentioned here as well. So we have Amalek. The Canaanites, which are conquered by Asher, and then Asher that's going to be conquered by the ships of Kitten. So that's that's the progression here. Um, so that's where I would look at at the beginning of nations. And of course, the next chapter, chapter 11, is going to deal with the Tower of Babel. And we know that these are all similar. I mean, Asher, which is Assyria. Um, these are all pagan nations that persecute God's people at different times, right? Amalek is uh, the one that attacked them in the wilderness. Um, the Assyrians, they brought about uh, the Assyrian and, and really the Babylonians are, are closely connected to the Assyrians. Um, I don't know. That's just where I would place it. If thou were the first of the nations, I would be thinking of the globalists if I was going to provide a symbol uh, um, for Amalek here. But you're saying that, you know, you could connect this to Islam just because of the, the word nations. But then every time we see the word nations, we'd have to think Islam, which isn't the case. There'd have to be more to attach it to Islam. Now that I wouldn't disagree with. Yeah. 
but the the situation we've got here as as is presented in exodus 17 amalek is the first nation that comes up to war against the children of israel after they have left egypt mm -hmm. there's no doubt about that So, I mean, I mean, that's why we put it's the first of the nations to war against Israel. Because Amalek isn't technically the first of the nations. Right. Beginning of the Gentiles, right? I mean, that's the way you would translate it, the beginning of the Gentiles. Um, but his latter end shall be that he shall perish forever. And we know that happens with Amalek. So Amalek um, is finally destroyed by Saul 400 years after uh, Moses's prophecy regarding their destruction. Well, mostly destroyed by Saul, but definitely destroyed by Samuel. Because Saul allowed the king of the yeah. Amalekites yeah. to live. And some had to have escaped because the descendants of Agag, of the king of the Amalekites, were still alive at the time of Esther. Right, yes. But but you, you understand what I mean, that Saul was asked to destroy it, and Ellen White gives that as the fulfillment of that prophecy. Sure. 400 years after it was given, which is one of the chronological keys that we use for that period of time. Right. Um, and so you're going to have this prophecy about Christ. And out of Jacob shall he come that shall have dominion, which would refer to Christ. Right. And shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. So this is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Would, is that how we would take verse 19 of Numbers 24? I would think so. Okay, so we have this one here, to the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, it could be that when we look at this prophecy here and just in the context of Christ, um, you have the destruction of Jerusalem. Then he looked, then Balaam, he's going to look upon Amalek. And he takes up this parable regarding Amalek saying he was the beginning of, of the Gentiles, but his latter end will be, he shall perish forever. Because that's the prophecy of Moses. So he's, whether it's just through the Holy Spirit, probably it is, because I don't know if he would know about the prophecy of Moses regarding Amalek. But Amalek is going to be symbolizing something in the future. So the question is, what is Amalek symbolizing in the time of Christ? Or is, it, is this the period right after the destruction of Jerusalem that's going to continue on? Is this going to be the destruction of Rome that's being talked about? Would, okay, if, if this is the destruction of Rome, then are we going to apply that city as being Rome instead of being Jerusalem? No, the city would be Jerusalem. Because this would be the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and that's the only reference we'd have to that is the destruction of him, of him that remaineth in the city which we already know um, in the book of Daniel is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and, and Jesus picks up on that, right? And, and Ellen White as well, that you know, no Christians were killed in the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. 
right? So the star of Jacob is Christ, and he shall come that shall have dominion, right? He comes here when in his first coming, I mean, he is the king, but he doesn't, he doesn't end up destroying the Romans. In this sense, he destroys uh, those that remain of the city, right? Because Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. If we look at Daniel chapter nine, uh, Christ dying for us in the midst of the week is connected with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The two are related to each other. So Christ coming and dying for us is related to the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem ends. And, and if we were going to make an application to our time, that would refer to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Right. Right. And that's why I say Eber would refer to those who are God's people that are afflicted. Okay. I know this is rather problematic, you know, trying to put this all together, but to me, there has to be, we have to think about all these other verses that are connected with these verses as a symbol. So we have no, nothing about people remaining in the city of Rome being destroyed. Right. We have yes. that with Jerusalem. Yes, we do. But then he's going to look on Amalek. He's going to look on the Kenites. And then it doesn't say he looks on Asher. But um, and then he's going to take up this parable. And he says, alas, who shall live when God doeth this? So what is this question? Remember, this is this is a question that's asked other places. Uh, in, in different words. Where can we think of examples of this question? How about Revelation? How about Malachi 3 2? Okay, Malachi 3 2. Yeah, who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. So there's that one. And there's Revelation chapter six. Um, for the great day of his wrath is come, verse 17. And who shall be able to stand? Right. Yeah. We also have a similar question in Daniel chapter 12 um, and in Daniel chapter 8. And that question is the how long questions. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Right. And for us as Seventh-day Adventists. Um, uh, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? So I think this is the same question being asked in Numbers 24, verse 19. 24, 19 or 24, 23? Uh, yeah, 24, 23, pardon me. Yeah. And yeah, so 24, 23. So alas, so who shall live when God doeth this? So we're, we're having this interrelationship then with the questions asked by Malachi, the questions asked by Daniel. Um, would this also apply with, with some of what we've seen in the visions of Ezekiel? Well, yeah. I mean, there's, there's other things in Ezekiel as well, um, because it's going to be talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. I can't think of the particular question in Ezekiel that just like these other ones, but I'm sure there is something to that effect. So when he takes up his last parable, he asks that question, you know, how long shall be the vision? Basically, you know, who shall be able to stand? This is the question that is asked, you know, several times throughout scripture. So now we have the ships shall come from the coast of Kittim and shall afflict Asher. So the question is, um, 
we know that this this is sort of that question of when is the, when are these things going to to end is one aspect of the question which doesn't show up so much here but who shall live when he when god doeth this who shall be able to stand and to me they're related questions um so this must be the final conflict the ships of kittim here would be related to um Daniel chapter 11, um, verse, uh, whichever verse that it is, when he shall come against them with many ships, right? Right. So this is referring to our time, um, the time of the end in our time. All right. I would have no disagreement with that. Yeah. Now, we have this, this passage, and Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. So there's a separation that occurs between the two. Now, as Mrs. White had written, before returning to his people, Balaam uttered a most beautiful and sublime prophecy of the world's redeemer and the final destruction of the enemies of God. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and shall destroy the children of Sheth. He was permitted to look down through the ages to the first advent of Christ and then forward to his second appearing in power and glory. He would see the king above all kings, but not at present. He would behold his majesty and his glory, but at a great distance. He would be among the number of the wicked dead who should come forth in the second resurrection to hear the awful doom, depart from me, you cursed. He would behold the redeemed ones in the city of God, while he himself would be shut out with the wicked. Balaam closed by predicting the complete destruction of Moab and Edom, of Amalek and the Kenites thus leaving the Moabitish king no ray of hope. The prophecy of Israel's triumph uttered by this apostate is similar to the, de the, the declaration made by Judas when he brought back the 30 pieces of silver and declared before the dignitaries of the church the innocence of Christ. So Balaam is being compared with Judas. Uh -huh. Judas was given the opportunity with great light to learn more of Christ, but his greed kept him from going to accepting everything that, that Christ was offering. Uh -huh. The same thing can be said here of Balaam. Balaam had been permitted to behold the signal manifestations of divine power. God had communicated through him the most sublime, precious, and sacred messages of truth, yet he did not humble himself to repent of his avarice and presumption. He did not find it necessary for his character to be humbled into the dust. No further light would be granted him. He had rejected the last call of mercy. He could no longer halt between two opinions. He could not serve man. He could not serve God and mammon. Excuse me. He had sacrificed the favor of heaven to obtain the wages of unrighteousness. And he was numbered with the enemies of God. Now that's, that's pretty direct. 
These lessons the people of God at this time should take to heart. They may have a knowledge of divine things and ability to fill an important place in the work of God, yet unless they cherish a simple dependence upon their Redeemer, they will be ensnared and overcome by the enemy. Is this not a warning to us today? By nobleness of aim and completeness of execution, they may win for themselves a name and honor higher than that of kings, if they will make God their trust and suffer no outside influence to withdraw their interest or attention from the work appointed therein, appointed to them, excuse me. Those who would be men of power must determine to make the noblest use of every faculty and every opportunity. They must make the glory of God the first object of life and ever remember that goodness alone is true greatness. Now this next paragraph I think is, is rather interesting for what it, what it states. Balaam had been compelled to bless when his heart longed to curse. He had been disappointed in his hope of riches and honor, and he was almost as deeply grieved at the result of his efforts as was Balak. A plan was now suggested to his mind by the prince of darkness himself that seemed to promise the destruction of Israel. It was proposed to the king and immediately adopted. Here we have our adversary personally getting involved in this situation. The scripture doesn't explicitly say this, but Alan White does. Yes. Because we don't get this really, if we read the story of Balaam here, we don't see that what happens with uh, at Baal Peor is the result of this. But we know it does happen afterwards. But Ellen White says that this was suggested by Balaam. So I think that's interesting. The Moabites had found that so long as Israel remained true to God, he would be their shield. And no power of earth or hell could do them harm. The plan, was now, when, the plan now was to raise a barrier between them and God by enticing them to sin. If they could be led to engage in the licentious worship of Baal and Ashtaroth, their omnipotent protector would become their enemy, and they would fall an easy prey to the fierce warlike nations around them. Balaam soon left for his distant home, but his diabolical scheme was immediately carried out. As we were talking yesterday, when Balaam was taken to these different promontories to be able to look over the children of Israel, I asked the question if this was not and could not be tied back to what we're seeing in the story of Elijah where he was dealing with the priests of Baal and the priests of the grove. This portion here from the spirit of prophecy, if they could be led to engage in the licentious worship of Baal and Ashtaroth. So we have the worship, the idolatrous worship of Baal and that of Ashtaroth, male and female deities. Both are being mentioned as being part of this issue with Baal Peor.
So this plan as it is to be carried out, you have the Moabite king along with the Midianites and the Midianite princes that are now going to do this recommended temptation upon this with the children of Israel that we're going to find in chapter 25. So going to this, we have Israel at Shittim commit whoredom and idolatry. Phinehas killeth Zimri and Cosby. God therefore giveth him an everlasting priesthood. God commandeth Moses to vex the Midianites. We know that Balaam had been taken to the top of this Mount Peor. And from what we were reading the other day, we know that there was a temple that was dedicated to one of these false gods that was on this particular promontory okay okay just a, a thought or question um, okay so now because remember this uh diversion into uh the story of ba uh, balaam was because we were studying judges uh chapter 11 right, right. correct and so i don't know if i we should go into numbers 25 okay um, because we have to, we have to come back to Judges chapter eleven. I mean, we could go into Numbers twenty-five at a certain point, but this doesn't, this doesn't really add information to what we we needed. Like we needed to understand uh, the story of Balaam, and and mostly we were dealing with the three strikes of Islam. That was the the idea. I mean, that's why we went to Numbers twenty-two. Um, but I think we should go back to judges because we have to we have to address some points there. Um, otherwise, we're just going to be off track. We're, we're not going to be able to come back. We're going to be because this story is important um, in Numbers 25, but I don't think we're putting it in the right context now. I mean, it was important to look, I think, at the seven parables. Um, even though that went a little bit beyond what we were going to the story of Balaam for. Uh, but it does help us in understanding uh, this story of Jephthah. Does anybody remember? So is that okay, Dwight? I don't have a problem. Okay. Because I know you got numbers 25 queued up here. But... Um, what particularly was it in the story of Jephthah in Judges chapter 11 that made us go to the story of Balaam? Well, let's go back and look at it. All right, because it's, it's going to mention um, here in, uh, that's going to be, Because they're not going to mention Balaam by name, but we ended up going. Um, so I'm even try. I can't even remember now because we know it had to do with uh, the nations here that they were fighting against. Okay, so I pulled back up Judges eleven. Okay. So. As we begin here in Judges 11, 1, now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of an harlot, and Gilead begat Jephthah. So 
from the Hebrew, son of a woman and harlot. And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah, and they said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Right. So they're going to call Jephthah back because he's a mighty man of valor. Right. And so they turn again to him, and that's going to be in verse 8. Uh, let me see. No, in verse, well, it's going to start earlier. Verse. Let's just, let's take this. Kind okay. of, yeah. Okay. Step by step. Okay. And we're going to come to it. Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. And it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And they said unto Jephthah, come and be our captain, that we may fight with the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, did ye not hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are you come unto me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, therefore we turn again to thee now, that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon, and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us, if we do not so according to thy words. And Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him a head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. And Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, What hast thou to do with me, that thou art come against me to fight in my land? And the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt, from Ammon even unto Jabbok and unto Jordan. Now therefore restore those lands again peaceably. And Jephthah sent messengers again unto the king of the children of Ammon, and said unto him, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness unto the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. And in like manner they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent, and Israel abode in Kadesh. Yeah, so we're going to see here that the reason that they conquered Edom and Moab was because they weren't given free passage into the land of Canaan. Right. So that's why they conquered them. Yeah, okay, go on. Then they went through the wilderness and compassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab and came by the east side of the land of Moab and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arna Ammon was the border of Moab. Mm -hmm. And Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, the king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said unto him, Let us pass, we pray thee, through thy land into my place. But Sihon trusted not Israel, 
to pass through his coast. But Sihon gathered all his people together and pitched in Jahaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. And they possessed all the coasts of the Amorites from Arnon even unto Jabbok, and from the wilderness even unto Jordan. So now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before the people of Israel, and shouldest thou possess it? Will not thou possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, them we will possess. And now art thou anything better than Balak the son of Zippor? It is so. King of Moab, did he ever strive against Israel or did he ever fight against them? While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns and in Aurora and her towns and all the cities that be among the coasts of Arnon, 300 years. Why, therefore, did ye not recover them within that time? Wherefore, I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. The Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. Howbeit the king of the children of Ammon hearkened not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent him. Okay, so... So there's a number of things here, Stephen. We have these 300 years, and you have dealt with that before. And what is this chronological reference? If you're there, Stephen. Yes, that's... Um, so let's go back to um, Sihon. I understand the... Uh, was defeated about yeah. their time. Which, we, which I would place in 1494 BC. Yeah. So that would put this. Is that at, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if we go 1494, this puts this in 1194. This story of yes. Jephthah. Okay. So we still got another hundred years roughly before Saul. Yes. Okay. And, and then of course they're referencing um, here, which was the main uh, point having to do with Balak. So that was going back to uh, which verse was that again? Yeah, verse 25. Now, and now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel or did he ever fight against them? So the question was, when we were making this application of this story of Jephthah, uh, we're applying it to this movement. And that this is um, a message that had been rejected that then is going to be accepted again. And, and that's going to be by Jeff. Right. So Jeff accepts this message after the movement had rejected it. It's the message of July 18. And in that context, um, we're going to have these um, uh, Jephthah sending messengers to the king of the children of Ammon. So this is a message of July 18th 
that is going to be about Islam, right? I would think so. And so when we see this reference then to Balak, we go to the story of Balaam on his journey when Balak calls him to come and curse Israel. And the, and the way that the movement had understood this story is these are going to be these three strikes of, by Islam against the United States, beginning with 9-11 and, and the Midnight Cry and the Sunday Law. Right? That's, that's what we understood. But now, if, as we look at this, we can see that each one of those represents um, prophecies regarding Islam. What the first ones turned out of the way, the second one crushes the foot of Balaam, and then the third one causes Balaam to uh, fall down under well his his ass falls down underneath him because there's this angel so these are in a sense um restraints of islam correct is that how we understood it that this ass then is being restrained Well, I think that's yes. that something we had established. Yeah, okay. So when we look at the July 18th prediction, one of the things we came to the conclusion was that warning about the destruction of Nashville led to a restraint of Islam. It's not something we can prove. We can't prove that by us warning Nashville that that stopped actually an attack against the United States. And we, we don't have um, you know access to uh, the intelligence of uh, you know American intelligence, but it, it is possible that that would have hindered uh, an attack that could have been planned. We don't know, but it's possible. It could even be just that God restrained it because of us warning Nashville, and that for a time that prophecy or prediction of Ellen White's is, is on hold until it does occur. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is going to put Jephthah's vow into context as well, which is, I think, where we have to, because just when we went off dealing with Balaam, I'd been studying Jephthah's vow. And what does that particularly mean? That was part of the um, the struggle, because I was putting this, I was trying to look at this as further on, but this, this I think, refers not to something that's going to happen in our movement, but something that has happened in our movement. That's interesting. Yeah. But before we get into that, how be it the king of the children of Ammon hearken not unto the words of Jephthah? Why is that important for us at this time? Well, it was the warning of Nashville regarded by no. the king? No, it was not. Because that's the, the words of Jephthah. This, this is the message of warning of the destruction of Nashville. Okay. That, that's what his message is to the king of Ammon. This is the message that was given by Jeff, the July 18, 2020 prophecy. So the movement represents Jephthah. The message of July 18th is represented by Jephthah. Okay. Not the movement. All right. So this is just a message, right? We're looking at these as messages. Even when we look at Balaam, remember, we look at this as 
as prophecies regarding right. Islam. And, and these are connected to the United States, which is riding this ass. So part of the part of the problem that we were having when we were studying this is we were trying to make this one to one correlation between institutions or people or nations. Um, but now we know that these are about messages. And, and that's the case in the story of Balaam prophecies, but here also in the story of judges, these are messages. And so there's a message that was rejected that was then accepted right so i mean jeff is one i mean not personally but his movement ffa ended up rejecting the message of july 18 until after parminder's rebellion and then we're going to have jeff pick this message up again right so that's going to be them calling jephthah and then that message is going to be a message given here symbolically to Ammon, the king of the children of Ammon. But that message is going to be rejected. Then Jephthah is going to make this, this tragic vow, as it says in here in our headings, right? And this vow was the thing that troubled me. What did this mean? And so originally I was putting this into the future and I was taking, um, I was trying to apply this to the movement rejecting the message presently um, and then turning back to it. And, and maybe it does have an application there, but I think that this tragic vow only makes sense in the context of what happened with July 18, 2020. Okay. So that's where we're going to have to get to tomorrow. We're going to have to look at this, this vow of Jephthah and what it means symbolically yeah because there's quite a bit there yeah and and but that was where i was struggling for a long time and then just before we went to balaam i had figured this out you know it, it came to me what this meant but it meant i had to change my views about what we were looking at partly um but the story of Balaam really does help us because it really helped us put into context what these three strikes are and what the July 18, 2020 prediction was. Right. That is, it's, it's this uh, dealing with the prophecy of Balaam. It's dealing with this attack on the United States by Islam. And so this vow is going to be connected to that. Okay, so now we're going into it in detail now. Right now, there was a question in the chat that we had not had not addressed, asking, "Is Ammon the same as Anon?" No, Arnon the same as Anon. Look, look at the chat. It says, "Yeah, it Anon. says Arnon." That's the river Arnon. Is it the same as Anon? Okay. And I would think they're not the same. I'm not sure what Anon is, so maybe I shouldn't say that. Um, that's in the book of John. John was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there. So is the river Anon the river Arnon is the question. Okay. I don't, I don't think so. I could be wrong. So that, that was just a question. I don't know if it's. So anyway. I don't I don't have a definite answer. I just don't think they're the same place. Okay. Now, do we have any other questions or comments with what we've been addressing today?
All right, I will do what I can to have these notes for judges 11 and 12 sent out. Okay. And then be prepared for this for tomorrow. Yeah, and then because I think we need to tie this up, and then we can decide where we go from there, because we will come back to numbers uh, to the rebellion at Baal Peor. Okay. Um, at some point, I just don't know when. Okay. If that's if that that seems fine to everyone, you don't mind jumping back into judges. Yes, it helps clarify. Yes. Okay. I think those were all affirmatives that, that everybody's okay. I heard them at the same time, but. Okay, Dwight. Okay. So, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these examples that are presented before us in scripture. We thank you for this opportunity to learn more of you and of that which is necessary for us to know at this time before this message goes out, this final message to the world. Be with us now, direct us, show us that that you would have us to do. Help us today so that all we come in contact with may see your character and not ours. Direct us in this path, be with us now, we ask in Jesus name, amen. Amen.